Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech here, Research in Manoa, our flagship science show uh, every Monday at one o'clock, one o'clock rock, so to speak. And today we have a very, very special guest who has flown in to give a talk at the university, um, the university uh, at Manoa tomorrow. And his name is Brett Finley, um, and he is professor of microbiology at the University of uh, British Columbia, where he is the Peter Wall Distinguished Professor. He is a world leader in how bacterial infections work, and he's been studying microbes for over 30 years and has published over 450 articles. He's also a founder of the biotech companies Inimex, Inimex, Inimex I get that? Yeah. Uh, Ven Vendanta and Microbiome Insights. He's an officer of the Order of Canada, which is the highest Canadian civilian recognition you can get. He lives in Vancouver with his wife, and this is a salient point, she is a pediatrician. <laughs> That's important. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Brian. Thanks, Jake. Yeah, thanks. Great to have you here. Yeah, pleasure. Well, let's talk about your book, which is a scientific bestseller and readable. It's called Let Them Eat Dirt uh, with Brett Finley. And uh, as they say, it's an earthy book. Yeah. Well, I said I always once read a dirty book, so there we go. <laughs> dirty book. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess the title is a bit misleading. It should be let them eat the microbes that you find in dirt. And but really, the idea of the book is to write a layperson book. So the science is there, but it's not up front and center. We don't have references so much in it. And it's to basically educate parents, anyone of interest, really the effect that these microbes are having on kids early in life. And knowing that, how can you do better things for your child to help them raise them with your microbes instead of without them, which is what we're trying to do now. So what, what do microbes do for me? Uh, I, you know, I know that microbes are part of the deal, and if I had no microbes, I could not live. Yep, but yep, what do they yep, do for yep. me? They do a lot of things. So um, they, they live all over us. Um, the numbers are astounding. There's at least as many microbes in and on you as there are human cells. There's 15 times more genes and genetic material. So I love to tell my students they're more microbial than human, which they always get upset at. <laughs> um, and you know, they, they live, like I said, on the skin, scalp, armpits, wherever it's moist, urinary tract. Most of them live in the intestine, especially way down low in the intestine. And I mean, I don't jokingly say diarrhea is my bread and butter because that's what we work on. So we're going to restrict this for fecal I think content. I'm really going to enjoy but, this book. <laughs> but, you know, to put it in perspective, if you had one gram of feces, which is basically kind of the tip of your finger, there's more microbes in that in your intestine than all the people in the world. So it's just there's 100 trillion microbes in and on us. What and kind so, of microbes are they? All sorts. Um, most of them, especially in the gut, where there is no air, they live, they call anaerobes, so they, there's no air, so they, they, they metabolize differently. But they're, they're very different, and you know the microbes on your scalp are very different than your armpit, than in your intestine, because these are different environments. And um, what's interesting is everyone's different. We, there is no conserved human, there's no one species that's found in all people. Um, so they're, they're very different. So they're, even though you and I are 99.9% .9 genetically identical, our microbes are at best 50%. So I argue that's what makes us individuals. You know, that's what makes us different. Sounds like a great way to do a, a CIS. <laughs> that you can you can make an identification of somebody that would be unique in the world by taking a profile of his microbes. No? They're already doing that, and they're oh, actually right. pretty good at, at, at you know digging up dead pigs and checking how their microbes change. And can we identify wh wh which one it was? The other things they do is they they help break down our food. So they do most of your digestion, especially you know, plants and fibers and nuts and legumes and all the things your mom told you you should eat, you never wanted to. They don't do much with white sugar and white flour because that's already broken down, which is actually bad diet-wise. Um, they help us develop our immune system and that's why they can push you towards allergies and asthma or other ways. Um, and probably the most fascinating area I'm finding these is they affect the brain and they affect how the brain develops and there's animals that don't have any microbes in them, we call them germ-free animals, their brains are screwed. They actually do not develop normally. Uh -huh. So they're part of our normal development. So and then all the brain diseases such as ADHD and autism and stress and anxiety and depression, these things now all seem to have microbial links too. So we knew they were there ever since Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek made the first microscope 330 years ago. But we didn't know what they did in the last five years as sequencing came online so you don't have to grow them, we now realize they're there and that, that's, that's where this world is just exploding. 
Yeah. Wow. Really interesting. So how do I get my microbes? Ah. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm certain. I'm not. Am I born with them? Yes. So generally thought, it's thought the feces, the, the fetus is sterile, but there's some argument not. They can find. So basically, your mother's very first birthday present for you is, is it's gross. Is basically a big gulp of vaginal and fecal microbes. It sounds terrible, but that actually is really important for setting up life. And if you're born by a cesarean section, your microbes will be more like the mother's skin than the vagina. Ah. And the reason that's important is vaginal microbes and fecal microbes are the one that break down breast milk yeah. and do this. And so if you're born by a cesarean section, you don't have these. And also the simple fact of born by a cesarean section puts you at much more risk for getting asthma and obesity later in life. So it's as soon as you're born, you bam, you come into this microbial world and you get it from everything you put in your mouth and just everything you contact and watch a little kid, what do they do? They do this the whole time, right? Why are they doing that? Yeah. You know, they're sampling the microbes. Yeah. So it starts at birth, it bounces around. If, the first if I had a choice, I'd rather not do cesarean then. Yes, right. yeah, uh, but 10 percent of women have to have cesarean medically. So, so, so then the question comes. So, there's work going on. One of the companies I'm involved in is 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 recolonization of vaginal microbes following cesarean uh, section. Uh, uh, uh. So, even some naturopaths are swabbing out the vagina and then colonizing the kid's mouth and things. So, can you? replant these microbes that they've missed out on because of medical reasons. Well, the, the data's still out. We know that you can do that, but whether or not you have to wait three years to see if that affects asthma and obesity. So that experiment is ongoing, and I'll call you in three years. Oh, please. <laughs> so so, so, so there, there, there's a lot of um, look at that. And then, you know, as you grow, you, basically in your childhood microbe, and then you go through adolescence, and then you get your adult microbe. Now you're collecting and them. You're collecting you them all the time. Life. And and But if you leave your normal life, your whole adult life is pretty constant unless you do something drastic like move to India, become a vegetarian. Or, you know, if you change your environment, then it changes. But generally speaking, it's pretty constant. And then as you turn 65 or older, your microbes then change again. So they're your friends for life. They're there. Should I move to India? Would I do better? <laughs> would, if I have a diverse collection of, of a microbiome, would I be better off? Well, you're going to suffer for several months of severe diarrhea, you know, <laughs> okay. but once you get past that. Um, so, yes, you're right. In a place like India, they have much more diverse microbes, but they also have a lot of infections. And so it's this kind of balance between hygiene, avoiding these infections, and then acquiring your normal microbes. So theoretically, you could establish the perfect... I know I'm wrong about this, but you could establish the perfect biome. Uh, I give you an infusion, if you will, of the perfect biome, and you're you're good to go. Yeah, the problem is we don't know what the perfect biome is yet. <laughs> okay. So we have some clues, <laughs> and you know some of the early work we work we did on asthma. We can take a three-month-old baby look in their feces and say, do you have these four microbes or not? If you have these four microbes, you're not going to get asthma. If you don't have those four microbes, you're at high risk for asthma. So then in a mouse, we then showed we could add those four microbes back to human feces, put it in the mouse, we could actually prevent asthma. So where we're heading with this is your child is three months old, you screen the microbes, you say you're lacking these, you need to take this probiotic kind of mix of these four microbes, or if you have to have antibiotics at three months of age, we can replenish this. And by one year of age, it's too late. Uh -huh. um, so uh -huh. yeah, in theory, we can do the, do the recolonization, but we just don't know what the good ones are yet. We're still too stupid in that sense. Well, extending the same notion, I mean, if I catch it at the right time in development, say before one year or whatever, whatever that is, <clears throat> I can prevent things other than asthma too, right? Yes, you would. You can prevent um, allergies, obesity, diabetes, um, autism, ADHD. There's there's significant um, indications there. Really, when you look at the diseases of what we call the Western world or developed world diseases, you know those are the ones I'm listing inflammatory bowel disease, et cetera. Those all have microbial links, and many of those links are set up very early in life. Even before you're born, you're a thin mother, third trimester, you say, okay, I'm pregnant, I can eat anything I want for once, I don't have to diet, I'm gonna gain 100 pounds more than I should. Mm -hmm. It turns out that when that happens, the mother's microbes go to the obese microbes. When that child is born to a thin mother that over eight, they have a much higher chance of being obese because they inherit the mother's, quote, obese microbes, even though she was thin before that. So even early um, when the mother's pregnant, you've got to think about you know, what's happening here. Fascinating. So, <clears throat> so the, the, the whole idea, the title of the book um, is, it's okay to allow your child to have contact 
with microbes, dirt, whatever it might yeah, be. Yeah. It's okay that he touches his mouth. Um, is there is there a, a more specific advice that you would give about that? Yeah. I mean, where's the limit of it? Yeah, so, I mean, the book is help, full of helpful do's and don'ts, like what can a parent do in this sense? And, you know, for example, let the kid lick the floor of your house, that's probably fine. But the floor of the subway station is probably not such a good idea here. <laughs> let them play in the sandbox, unless there's cat feces in there. They probably shouldn't be chewing on cat feces because it's got parasites in it, for example. So it's this whole balance between hygiene, you know, avoiding infections, but also microbial exposure. So some simple things, such as, you know, getting a dog. Having a dog in your house will decrease asthma by 20%. Because what does a dog do? It goes, rolls in the yard and everything, preferably in feces, and it comes and smothers the kid and licks it, right? And for the cat lovers in the audience, there's no daddy either way, I think, because cats sort of sit in the corner and kind of go like, <laughs> they don't interface with the kid as much. Um, so it's not good or bad. So, yeah, that's in the book we've tried to, you know, allow parents to say, you know, this based on this, you know, like if a kid spits a soother on, on the ground, um, you can go and wash it off or binky, whatever you call it here, you can go and wash it off, or you can put it in your own mouth for that kid. If you put it in your own mouth, back in the kid's mouth, that kid will have less chance of getting asthma and obesity, whereas the one that ran to the washroom and washed it off, they have much higher rates, just by the simple fact of inoculating the parent's microbes into the kid. And so you can do that. You can do that. I mean, that's not hard to do as a parent. And so, I mean, the biggest issue, the, the worries I have is the, the parents that are real, you know, germophobes, they bubble wrap their kid, that they, they use hand sanitizer on their kid a hundred times a day and they don't let the kid get tall dirty. And I understand where they're coming from because if clean is good and we've shown them last 125 years hygiene works, we've gotten rid of infections, then cleaner must be better. So let's just clean them sure, up. Let's never let them near a microbe. Let's keep them in the condominium and never let them go outside and, and they're going to be perfect. All the studies show that's wrong. Those kids are much more at risk for all the diseases we're talking about. And so it's very hard to convince a you know, germaphobe mob, ease off, let them get a little dirty, let them chew in that stick for a while, you know, or crawl around and lick the floor. But, you know, it makes sense, because what do kids do? This is what a kid does, right? They shovel everything in their mouth. And if that was so bad for us evolutionary, I'm convinced we wouldn't do that. So I'm convinced the kids are trying to figure out what's in my world, let's put it all in my mouth and check it out. So when they turn 20, they've already seen it. It's no big deal, yeah. instead of reacting to it and having all these Western maybe diseases Maybe that's a good, a good uh, behavior. To do. Maybe that came down, you know, the generations. Well, I, I mean, biology doesn't do many things by accident. I mean, it yeah. probably is. And if you think the way that our ancestors lived 1,000, 10,000 years ago, they don't live anything like we do now, right? They were out there and the kids were rolling around all the time. They were strapped to the mother's breast or on the back and they just chuck them in a the dirt pile. Earthy. Really got to do something. <laughs> Earthy, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I guess the point I want to make is that we are taking something out of our, our evolution that we have always evolved with. We are taking the microbes that we have always evolved with out of it. And we now realize that's a mistake. These things are doing stuff for us and there's a reason because we know they'll be there. We've evolved to do that. And so that's my big concern. Well, we have to be somewhat careful about it because there, you know, we have to mm, take a take a page out of modern science and make sure we're not doing damage in the process. And when we come back from this break, Brett, I want to talk about how you <clears throat> how you um, bring it all together, how you harmonize okay. yeah. uh, uh, both the the earthiness and the science so that you get the best possible result. Yeah. That's Brett Finley. He's a scientist in microbiology from the University of uh, British Columbia. We'll be right back. Aloha and Happy New Year. It's 2017. Please keep up with me on Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to talk about a clean and just energy future. Please join me on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock. Mahalo. Aloha. My name is Richard Emery, host of Condo Insider. More than a third of Hawaii's population live in some form of association. And our show is all about educating board members and owners about their responsibilities and obligations and providing solutions for a great association. You can watch me live on Thursdays, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. each week. Aloha. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, meeting people we may not have otherwise met and helping us understand and appreciate the good things about Hawaii. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech.
we're back, we're alive, and we're learning. We're doing <laughs> lifelong learning with Brett Finley, who's a professor of microbiology at the University of British Columbia, and he's uh, visiting Hawaii to give a public talk tomorrow. We're so excited to have him here today. So, um, you know, we gotta, we got to sort of bring everything into harmony between being really super clean yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and also, uh, you know, dealing with um, antibiotics and vaccinations and the yeah. like. Can you talk about that? Yeah, let's talk about antibiotics because I think that's something that we really need to chat about. So, so antibiotics, they were the wonder drug of the last century. They saved so many people from dying of bacterial infections. And go talk to someone who lived in the pre-antibiotic era about the, the, the fear if you had a fever, you could die. And, and they work, and they work in it. But the, what we don't, didn't think about with antibiotics is they, they carpet bomb microbes. They don't care if you're a germ, a bad one, or a good one. They just kill everything, and they indiscriminately wipe it all out. And we now realize that they take out the good with the bad. And every time you take antibiotics, your microbes get pushed further and further away from where they were towards the unhealthy end of things. And so I really think we need to rethink in antibiotics. We know overuse causes um, resistance. Everyone knows that. What people, I don't think, realize is they're not perfectly harmless. Yes, if you have a serious bacterial infection, take an antibiotic. You need that. But if it's a viral ear infection that antibiotics aren't going to work against, the medical community, you say, ah, well, just take it, can't hurt, right? We now realize that yes, indeed, these especially early in life can have a big effect. So we have to use these things um, you know, much more wisely. Another thing about antibiotics is that we use them in agriculture. About 80% of the antibiotics we use in the US are in agriculture because they cause a 15% increase in weight in pig, sheep, fish, any animal you, you choose. Yeah. Well, humans are animals, right? So the average American kid gets, gets up to 10 courses of antibiotics before they go to school. Involuntarily, yeah. So, and if they cause weight gain in every single animal, we're just animals. So there's a lot of thought that maybe this is actually contributing to childhood obesity, which yeah. you're seeing so much now, yeah. is, is these antibiotics. Yeah. So yes, they're wonder drugs, but they do have some side effects that I think we didn't appreciate before. So use them carefully. Yeah. yeah. So you talk about um, uh, resistance, um, the, the resistance of uh, the bacteria to antibiotics. I mean, is there is there a lesson here that we need to know about um, between you know the earthiness and the? Do we need to change our thinking about designing antibiotics? Yeah. So. Yes, I think that, well, I think we've exhausted most of the obvious antibiotics, and we went through a wonderful, you know, heyday of antibiotic discovery, and we really haven't made many new antibiotics lately. I think we've sort of exhausted it. So I think, you know, we're going to see new kinds of anti antimicrobial agents that, like, for example, could exist of a very sophisticated probiotic that actually goes in and kicks the pathogen out, and it's not really an antibiotic. I think we do have to really um, think about our usage of antibiotics and use them wisely. These are, these are, we have to treasure these gifts. They're, they're, you know, just don't use them willy-nilly just because you can. You know, if you really need it, use them, but use it sparingly because from a microbial point of view, resistance is futile. They, they, they will overcome the, these things and become resistant. Yeah. So just use them wisely. And the best antibiotic is one that doesn't uh, you know, uh, destroy or damage your, your regular uh, microbial Yeah, viral. but all antibiotics are well, non-specific. There is no antibody you can take that will target a particular bacteria. Okay. There's some that will target sort of a, a smaller subgroup, but these things have drastic effects on the microbial population in you. I mean, ask any woman who's taken an antibiotic for an ear infection if she gets a urinary tract infection. That's because it's affect the microbes in the, in, in, in the urinary tract, and then these pathogens crawl in, and they get yeast infections and bacterial infections. So yeah, they're, they're, they're tough. Action, reaction. Yeah. What about uh, vaccines now? That's, that's uh, even a more interesting topic. Huh? Yeah, so we, I dedicate a chapter to the vaccines, and that's the one chapter, I must admit, I come out very strongly saying, get your vaccines. I mean, my wife is a pediatrician, and she spends her many much of her time trying to convince someone that says I'm not gonna get vaccinated. She has yet to have someone that by the time she's done with them doesn't vaccinate their kids. <laughs> she knows every trick of the book for convincing these people. And you know, there, there's a lot of fraudulent um, science about vaccines. And I mean, the data says they work and they work beautifully. And I think what people need to remember is they're living in a, in a wonderfully safe, from an infectious point of view, time in the world, and they don't remember what, you know, someone that gets paralyzed with polio and ends up in an iron lung the rest of their life. Ask anyone that's been around a while, they know what this disease is, it's terrible. And all these kids used to die of all these things, but because they, 
because the, the vaccines work. So vaccines work. I mean, you know, we jokingly, we have, um, you know, every, every flu season, my wife brings home the flu vaccines and we have a shot party. So you get your flu vaccine and you have the tequila shot and then we invite the neighbors and it's, it's a wonderful it. time. So yeah, no, I, 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 every parent really should get their kids vaccinated. Now, when we spoke earlier, you mentioned that your biome has something to do with how, how successful the vaccine is because your biome deals with immunity. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so what we know is these microbes really do influence how our immune system develops. And they're really important and that's why you can be pushed towards that asthma or allergies if your microbiome is upset by antibiotics or C-section. And so, yeah, there's, we and others are doing some really neat research on even improving vaccines further, making them work better um, by basically tweaking the microbes so when you get vaccinated, your immune system is even better for this. It's early days. It's not commercial yet, but, I mean, we're, we're all thinking that direction. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you talk uh, in the book, I suppose, in large part about kids. You mentioned here that you have to do some, you should do some things before the child is like one year old. Uh, and after that, uh, the, the child's development involves, um, you know, new relationships yeah. with new, new uh, nice bacteria. Yeah. Um, but what about adults? What about me? Yeah. What about you? Uh, what, what does this mean for us? It means a lot. So, I mean, okay, you know, we can't fix when we were one, but we can sure fix you know, what's the expression, when's the best time to plant an oak tree 20 years ago, when's the next best time now, right? <laughs> and we're realizing that at all stages of life, these microbes play a big role, uh, you know. Um, exercise affects microbes, um, and we know, you know, weight issues and everything, these are all microbial, um, microbial, and I think, you know, depression, anxiety, these types of mental um, illness associated with it, microbes play a role in that. And, and as I was telling you, we, we, I wrote a list of the top 10 reasons why Americans die. Only one is obviously microbial, and that's um, influenza and lung diseases. But actually, when you look closely, nine out of those 10 have microbial links now. In five years, we didn't know this. The only one that doesn't have an effect is accidents. So you can't say the microbes made me do it, at least not yet. <laughs> but all these others, things like atherosclerosis, now there, there's, there's links to it, cancer and wow. cancer chemotherapy, wow. there's microbes links to it. Um, and dementia, Alzheimer's, there's microbes links to it. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a whole new world in realizing healthy aging and the microbes are involved in it. So, yeah, I think as an adult, we, you, you, just like kids, you need to think about you and your microbes and, you know, what you eat. Not only, you know, people say, I am what I eat. I disagree. Your microbes are really what you eat. And if you eat lots of white sugar and white flour, that doesn't even get down to the microbes in the gut. And so the microbes in your gut are actually starving, even though you're, you're eating, quote, food. And this is one of the big reasons you lead to obesity. So there's some fascinating things coming on the horizons. There's these personalized diets where you can say, okay, you have these microbes based on this you should eat that you have those microbes based on this you should eat that and this is showing real promise in, in weight issues um, mental um, mental issues these are doing it so yeah, I think, I think we're going to see just a whole new renaissance in microbiology. And about fecal, fecal transfusions. What about that? Should I have one tomorrow? Well, first of all, let me say about fecal transplants. This is not DIY. There, there's YouTube videos, and they say all it takes is a blender. If you perforate your gut, you will die. So first of all, remember that. <laughs> okay, thank but that you. being said, <laughs> fecal transfers have worked wonderfully for a disease called Clostridium difficile. This is if you have to have a hip transplant. The surgeons will fill you with antibiotics, wipe all your microbes so you don't get an infection. That's well, a friendly bacteria. No, it's a terrible bacteria. Oh, sorry. So they kill off the bad ones, okay. the good ones, and then this bad one called C. diff or Clostridium difficile okay. comes in, and this can kill you. And because antibiotics caused it, they try and treat with antibiotics, so they have 20% cure rate. But again, a fecal transfer from a healthy person causes a 95% cure rate. And so now these fecal transfers are being tried in things like inflammatory bowel disease and in autism and many other diseases. And what we're finding is that they work sometimes and don't work others. And the reason I think that is it depends on the donor. And so we're still trying to figure out, you know, you're a good donor and you aren't. You read papers where this donor worked beautifully, this one it didn't. And so, um, and then another interesting tidbit is the only adverse event associated with fecal transfer so far is when they did it from an obese person who was healthy into a thin person who had IBD. They cured the IBD, but that person also became obese. How interesting. So, so I mean, that makes sense with all we talked about weight and things. So, 
I think in the future, I call it repopulate, and this is to use microbes you grow in the lab. Here's 20 good ones. You take these, because it's way better than the idea of putting a tube down your throat and getting all this feces or enema type thing. Right, right. So there'll be a defined population that you will take to fix something. And that's where we're heading. We're not there yet, because a fecal transfer is a body fluid transfer. And you know we learn from hepatitis and HIV, this can have problems. And so I think the future will be defined microbes for a particular problem, and it'll get way less gross. It'll take the gross factor out of it's it. A, it's, it's medicine. It, it, it will be medicine. Designer yeah. biome with a focus exactly. on this, that, or the other exactly. thing. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, how far along are we on the path to that? I mean, you've been working on this for decades, m many decades already, sorry to say. <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, you know, how, how is the trajectory going here? The trajectory's fast. It's, a, it's, it's really easy to change someone's microbes, diet or antibiotics or prebiotics or probiotics. We know that now. So you can change someone's microbes really quick. So it's way quicker than, we still can't go in and fix a gene in you or I. So it's happening fast. It's, um, the FDA is actually struggling to keep up. How do we license these things? Are they a drug? It's a live microbe? Yeah. Is it a probiotic? Are they? they I mean, what's the rule right now? Well, it, it's chaos right now, to be blunt. They're, they're yeah. still trying to figure out how do we regulate these things. How do you regulate a fecal transfer? They, they just don't know yet. You know, and so, um, but it's happening fast. And you know, in, in the end of my book, I sort of give some future predictions of what microbes might actually, how they might actually be used therapeutically. But I, but I'm thinking, you know, within three to five years, we're already going to start to see some of this in the clinic and see it happening. Fabulous! What interesting research. Can you read us a paragraph and and um, uh, give us the flavor of your book, so to speak? Sure. Let I'll... them eat dirt. This is the flavor of <laughs> let them eat dirt. <laughs> Well, this is just a little blurb I wrote, you know, about what we're talking about the future, you know. So here's a doctor talking to a new mother, you know, congratulations, you're now pregnant. Your fecal microbiome tests all suggest there may be ways to improve the development of your baby during pregnancy. Our nutritionist suggests a modified diet that will alter your intestinal microbiome and enhance the health of your baby. Okay, then a little another visit. Congratulations, going to be a girl. Everyone looks great on the ultrasound. Your baby is still in breech position. We might have to do a C-section. One thing you might consider for this is take a vaginal swab before the delivery and wipe your baby's mouth with it in order to colonize your baby with the microbes that you would have given her if she'd born vaginally. This will make her healthier in the long run. And, um, you know, okay, so doctor says, congratulations, your baby turned around just in time. Your vaginal delivery was great. As you know, you've given antibiotics for group B strep as a preventative measure, which may have altered the newborn's microbiota. It actually does. Since you're breastfeeding, we'd like to, you to put these few drops of the solution on your breast just prior to feeding. It contains a few probiotics that replenish your baby's microbiota with microbes that are beneficial at this stage for your baby's early mental immune development. <laughs> and so, you know, doctor, don't worry, you're in attraction. Infections like the one your daughter had are fairly common at six months of age. The antibiotic treatment worked nicely and the infection is now clear. <laughs> However, we noticed that because of the antibiotic we gave her, your child's gut is now missing some good microbes, mm -hmm. pushing her, putting her at risk for getting allergies and asthma. Here's a solution of four microbes you can just squirt into their mouth to replenish these organisms. Fabulous. A new science, a whole new world. It Everyone is a whole new should world. know about this. And you know what? After this show, I'm going to go out and have lunch. And while I have lunch, I'm going to be thinking about my microbiome. Excellent. Thank you, Brett. Brett so, Finley. Thanks, Thank Jay. you so much. Good luck on the